Hi, and welcome to the World Beyond Belief. Uh, again, with us today, we have Eric Karlstrom, and we've been promising for we months now, I guess, to get back with Eric because we were talking, we have been talking about um, uh, global warming and the hoax of global warming, and we were talking about the New Age deception. And part of the New Age deception is this music, how Tavistock, the Frankfurt School, and uh, all the affiliates have been manipulating us through music. So we're going to learn a lot about that today from Eric. How are you doing, Eric? Welcome to the World Beyond Belief. Well, hi, Paul. It's good to be talking to you again uh, across uh, uh, vast distances with modern technology. And uh, <laughs> yeah, things are fine here in Colorado, southern Colorado. Although, uh, speaking of global warming, uh, We've had snow the last several days. Uh, uh, we got a foot of snow in, <laughs> in, the last, in the last week, probably a foot and a half. And some places in the San Luis Valley got quite a bit more. So this is kind of a winter that doesn't want to let go. And uh, I want to get to my garden. But, uh, you know, uh, we need the moisture. So we'll take it. Yeah, so, good. Yeah, the global warming thing is, is a, a gigantic piece of propaganda. And uh, I think a lot of the effect of these things is to try to dumb us down. Um, I talk to people about this, but uh, yeah, our topic is different today, and it's a very interesting topic, music, because I think you, we all kind of love and identify with music, and we have our connections with music. I hope we don't step on too many toes <laughs> as, we, uh, as we talk about music, because it is subjective, you know. Well, yeah, it's subjective, but it has been a big tool, and they have used it. I mean, if we just talk about the Beatles alone, we know, you know, they used their trick, the same trick they used with Miley Cyrus, innocent in the beginning, and then more and more gradually, more and more satanic and more seductive toward the end. Absolutely, absolutely. It was all very innocent when I started, or at least I thought so. Um, I'm, uh, I think we're close to the same age. I'm 66. I grew up in uh, Arlington, Virginia, and uh, all my friends, which is right outside of Washington, D.C., all my friends and I started playing guitars when the folk boom hit about uh, 1963 or so with the uh, Kingston Trio and Peter, yeah. Paul, and Mary. And we went from baseball and football to, um, you know, teaching each other guitar, singing and uh, you know it was it was quite exciting. It was a lot of fun. Uh, it was extracurricular. We would form little bands, and you know I thought the music was was like you say very innocent um, and a, and a great way to express yourself. It, it really grabbed you. But then within a few short years, uh, uh, you know, again the Newport uh, Folk Festival in 1965. Uh, now that the country had uh, been swept into the folk craze. Uh, Bob Dylan and a few others show up with electric guitars, and uh, now and then, of course, this precipitated a you know a cultural uh, crisis for the folkies. You know what right. is he doing? What are they doing? Pete Seeger <laughs> supposedly got up there with an axe and threatened to you know cut the electrical cable, you know, because this was noise. And anyway, the culture uh, went uh, you know when Caddy Wumpus really from then on, and of course by the late '60s we were into this hideous. Uh, uh, acid rock that, that, that accompanied the uh, the dumping of LSD on the American youth by our our favorite three letter word CIA, who had studied acid LSD for over fifteen years and found out that it is a psychosis producing weapon of war. So now what we've got is uh, uh, war uh, being. Um, you know, covert war being uh, declared against the youth of America. And, uh, of course, it was undeclared. So we were just, we're scrambling, you know, to, in this in this new new culture of, of uh, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, which was um, uh, radically different from the world, I think, that our parents grew up in, although I understand the 20s were pretty wild. Right. But, you know, our parents came out of the Depression, and they were hardworking, and, you know, um, 
I think the music was designed, you get lots of quotes to the effect that uh, it's designed to cause a generation gap so that the, the parents and the kids uh, can't relate to each other anymore. So. It worked. It worked it absolutely. Worked. <laughs> they were listening to Tommy Dorsey and we were listening to Santana and uh, what a gap it created. Yeah, the generation gap. And then, of course, the war in Vietnam was going on simultaneously. And uh, um, I think most of our parents would be a little bit like mine. They, you know, they, they came through World War II and they, 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 they bought into the anti-communism rhetoric of, the, of you know, national security. Got to gotta, gotta nip that communism in the bud right. in Vietnam and Guatemala and, and Iraq. And any time there was a third world nation that wanted to, you know, use its resources for the benefit of its own people. Then our CIA, wow. uh, yeah, what a, what a concept. Then our CIA quickly, and our media quickly uh, painted them as, uh, you know, left-leaning communist, uh, um, uh, great threat to uh, national security. Right. Well, it wasn't a threat to our national security. <laughs> it was perhaps a threat to our corporate uh, control. I think we've had, we've had tremendous confusion in this country. Uh, I've had friends that worked in the State Department. And, you know, it's understood, people my age, that the national interest in the State Department was always, you know, IT&T and uh, sure. Bechtel and the corporations. That's the national interest. And then national security, which we still hear a lot of nowadays, uh, that's really the interest of the fascist corporate system. And uh, so we, we've got this tremendous confusion of terms uh, and, and people integrate this, of course, through repetition. They hear it over and over again. They believe it. That's, that's what propaganda is. Right. And, uh, and then the music is very powerful. I, I think we, you know, we maybe should say a couple words about music. It's, it's fairly uh, almost mysterious quality. It has a powerful emotional effect. It can have. Um, the Bible talks about it a lot. It says that, you know, we're supposed to praise God with it. Um, and even there's implications in the Bible that, uh, you know, Satan himself might have been the, the, the highest of the, the choir directors praising God and then decided that he was right. going to bell. He wanted that praise for himself. And uh, so then, you know, if you kind of go with that uh, scenario, go with that, I don't know, I don't know what to call it because I believe it now. <laughs> uh, you go with that system. Um, then Satan wants to take that praise away from God and be praised himself. And meanwhile, he wants to, you know, win your soul and corrupt you. And, uh, um, and it seems like the sex, drugs, and rock and roll that took over in our generation, I would have been about, uh, you know, 1967, 68, I'm just starting college, you know. And uh, you go to right. college and all of a sudden... You know, your friends are smoking dope, and you've never right. even seen dope before, right. and they're listening to all this tremendous music. It was quite the cultural shock, really, a uh, cultural shock in your own backyard, in your own country. Right. So this was, like you say, imported. It was scripted. The Tavistock, as you say, is this, uh, you know, world's uh, brainwashing center, mother of all think tanks, I think you called it in a previous <laughs> interview. And it is. Um uh, taking taking its cues from the Frankfurt School out of Germany, so it's an international kind of um, uh, system. And then, of course, they they have all their their ex, uh, extension think tanks here in this country: Rand and and uh, Heritage Research Institute and Wharton School of Economics right. and MIT. And you go down the list; there's hundreds of them. And uh, and of course, this is right out of Britain. It's coming out of, a, of the psychological warfare division of the British Army right, right after World War I. So what we've seen is the weaponization of music, the weaponization of psychology, the weaponization of sociology and anthropology, and, of course, the weaponization of space, the earth, um, you know, the chemtrails, the atmosphere, weaponization of the atmosphere. So <laughs> there, there is this very persistent uh uh i guess you'd call it the ruling class uh, fascism is top-down revolution um they, they, they're pushing the revolution and they're doing it through very very smart uh hirelings at these think tanks um 
we're really battling against some tremendously intelligent, uh, and I would say perhaps um, psychopathic uh, individuals um, who, who seem to be hell-bent on, on gaining control of the entire system and taking out <laughs> we the people. And what right. makes it, of course, interesting is that we still have in this country uh, at least uh, lip service to the U.S. Constitution, which says that you know our rights are given to us by God, and we, the people, own the government. Well, it's been quite a while since uh, our presidents have acted independently. Um, I just did an extended series on my website, uh, 911nwo.com, uh, which I do for educational purposes. I'm not making money on it. Uh, on on the, the life and career of Alan Dulles, who was, of course, the first CIA director. And... Uh, 1953 to 1961 under Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Johnson. And uh, this guy who was, uh, you know, a lawyer with uh, Sullivan and Cromwell, the top uh, corporate uh, uh, legal firm out of Wall Street, uh, legal firm for the Rockefellers and all the other robber barons, basically, um, he acted with impunity. I mean, he betrayed and sabotaged every presidential administration he worked for over a period of 50 years. So these guys, uh, they're above the law. They think they're above the law. And uh, we're really getting to the point where we can kind of reconstruct um, and rectify and correct the propaganda version of history that we've been given uh, by, again, uh, you know, with these very powerful sources. And, and so when I did my article, a very extended article, I don't know, 100 pages, on Alan Dulles, I'm quoting directly out of 40 or 50 books, alternative history books that are in my library. And uh, I'm getting, you know, to the point where I don't care if it's online, uh, you know, it can be long. It's kind of just like a resource for people. Uh, somebody's going to read it, probably intelligence agencies. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, the, the documentation is there. I mean, this is coming from scholars, a lot of it. And uh, you know, Charles Hyam trading with the enemy, you know, talking about the, the connections, the Nazi-American connections before, during, and after World War II. I mean, you know, Alan Dulles uh, was setting up the Hitler regime with, uh, with his buddies, uh, the Rockefellers and the Bushes and the Harrimans. Right. And then he, he had uh, uh, extended, Rockefeller, uh, Standard Oil, and Chase Bank had extended connections with IG Farben which is this gigantic cartel, chemical cartel of Germany that allowed uh, Germany to become the Third Reich. Uh, so the, it, the enemy was created, uh, largely by Britain and American financiers, so that, so that Germany could, could squash their biggest rival, or hopefully would, would neutralize their biggest rival, which was, you know, Soviet Union. And... Uh, the hope they, they hoped they would kill each other in the process. But meanwhile... Uh, uh, all those Nazis came into the United States after World War II with Operation Paper. Right. Thousands of scientists who were rocket scientists and mind control scientists. So that's where our MK Ultra programs really, really derive. And then there's little Alan Dulles after World War II. He's having, uh, uh, he's got all kinds of complex financial agreements with Martin Bormann who was, of course, the, the money man for the Nazis who made it through the rat lines over to Argentina right. after World War II. And so your, your continent had lots of Nazis, and I'm sure it still does. I'm sure it does. Uh, yeah. Uh, so anyway, uh, I think to put this in the larger context, we are looking at the weaponization of music. Uh, the America seems to have been the lapdog of, of uh, well, the Cecil Rhodes uh, roundtable groups out of Britain wanted, uh, you know, uh, their, their stated goals are to bring American, uh, America back under its colonial status. And, uh, but first, however, it's supposed to be used to, you know, to implement their new world order. So we are the world's policemen. But even as we are, uh, you know, have our troops in 160 out of 195 countries, uh, right now, and our advisors, military advisors, um, it's America's being destroyed from within, and it has been for, as you know, decades. And the music and the, you know, the, the cultural terrorism that has been applied here deliberately by um, these subversive elements um, 
uh, you know, America is staggering. America is reeling. There's a tremendous amount of Satanism in this country. And I think, as you say, the, the rock music um, really, uh, really feeds that. And, and it's known that it feeds it. I mean, so what the picture that I'm getting is that we live in a world which is physical, but there is a spiritual component. And, uh, you know, there are apparently powers and principalities. And uh, people can be, can like like John D, the first great 007 spy for Queen Elizabeth back in the 1600s. Uh, he was, uh, you know, a genius and a and a, and a uh, well, he was a he was a spy. He was a cabalist. He was a, a geographer. He was an astrologer. He was a, a kind of the. Uh, Merlin, I guess, prototype of, of that, uh, but he was also a Rosicrucian, right. and this is a, a secret society that's, uh, you know, more or less, you know, based on magic, and uh, his, his disciple, his main one, uh, John Dee was apparently head of the Rosicrucians in England at that time, his main disciple, Francis Bacon, the modern father of science, who was also head of the Rosicrucians. Some people say he was the guy who really you know, presided over the Shakespeare's writings because he was a court uh, courtier and very much an insider. But anyway, so so you have this weird mix of spying and and Satanism, which you can trace up to Aleister Crowley, who was sure. also MI6 um, in the early part of the 1900s, and uh, he called himself the Beast 666. And uh, he was part of the Ord, the Golden Dawn, and the Ordo Templi Orientis. Um, so again, you have this weird mix of, of spies and Satanism. And I'm afraid with the Nazis, you see it again. This, the Nazis is a death cult. Um, the Skull and Bones is a death cult. It's an uh, American branch of the Illuminati, both of which call sure. themselves the Order of Death. Sure. Um, and that's, of course, our... George W. Bush, his father, George H. W. Bush, and his father, Prescott Bush, all Yale Skull and Bones um, insiders. Prescott Bush probably did as much as Alan Dulles to create the Nazis. Sure. Um, so, so there's this whole subtext to American history that uh, we're not taught, and I've come to grips with since retiring as a geography professor in 2011. And then, you know, the, I, hopefully we'll get back to the music. That's been my real love ever since I learned folk music back in the 60s. And I've been playing bluegrass and writing my own stuff. And I've got like 22 CDs I've made. And I've discovered that, the you know, it, it's very hard to make a living in music, even if you're yeah. pretty good at it. Um, there's all the promotion and, the, and all that stuff, marketing. But, um, yeah, the, the, the music it must be seen, I think, in this larger context that, that there is this... There is this, uh, well, the, the drugs, uh, the drugs came in uh, into this country uh, on, on a large scale uh, in the late 60s uh, with, the, uh, with, the, with the rock and roll music on a wide scale. So, uh, again, Tav Tavistock, uh, you know, wanted, has his documentation, they, they wanted to shift America from being a, you know, kind of industrial progressive, rational, scientific, Christian nation, which was hard to take down, they wanted to shift us into kind of a, into supernaturalism and mysticism and spiritism, occult, uh, black magic, uh, Satanism, and they found that the sex, drugs, and rock and roll, like of, you know, the ISIS cult and the Dionysian cults, that, that you know, that Britain... Uh, elite had been involved with for a long time, and the Nazis were certainly involved with. They wanted to transfer this to America, and they did. And so now America uh, is having a hard time uh, telling up from down, right from wrong. Right. Uh, what's the truth? What's a lie? Uh, there's so much propaganda, and uh, you know, of course, Timothy Leary years ago. You know the 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 CIA asset, who was a Harvard professor, a guru of LSD, is telling the kids, you know, turn on, turn. tune in, and drop out. Right. 
And uh, well, a lot of people did that, and they went to the communes, and they, uh, a lot of them wrecked their lives with uh, with uh, drugs. And, and I'm sure you know some of those people, and I know the casualties. Right. Maybe that's what we should talk about for a second, Paul. Cause, yeah. Uh, and and I'd like to hear from you too. Um, you know, th there was a there's a quite a toll, I think. Well, we lost a lot of our 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 uh, peer group to Vietnam. I mean, when I even when I just right out of high school, out of college, we lost a lot to Vietnam, and the rest of us were, we were during an awakening, and so we were looking for uh, uh, civil justice, and we were looking for ending the war, and I think the Tavistock group uh, co-opted us with music into sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I know that. Uh, we did a podcast that's been subsequently, they took the soundtrack down from, showing music before and after like 65. Uh, before, uh, my, the music that kids were listening to, you know, Put Your Head on My Shoulder, you were listening to the Kingston Trio. Actually, I sang for a group in college called the Duck Creek Boys that was modeled after uh, the Kingston Trio. And... Uh, it was a lot of fun and really innocent. But then after 65, you've got a real seriousness to the music. Even uh, the mamas and the papas. And, of course, this is when Laurel Canyon was blooming. And, all, and that was a satanic cult that was creating a lot, of, a lot of the music that was influencing us. So we were swept up. And next thing you know, we were, we were at Woodstock crawling around in the mud, uh, taking LSD and, uh, you know, far cry from what our parents who fought in World War II had, had in mind for us. Yeah, you know, uh, you mentioned Laurel Canyon, you mentioned Woodstock, and of course these are gigantic cultural icons of the late 60s. And uh, now uh, with, the, you know, the benefit of some research in 2020 hindsight, it does seem like Woodstock was a CIA operation, yeah. CIA being a, a, an extension, really, of the Tavistock Institute, trained by British intelligence, MI6. And, and, and this phenomenal book that uh, uh, has come out by David McGowan called Weird Scenes Inside the Canyon, Laurel Canyon, Covert Ops, and the Dark Heart of the Hippie Dream. I just can't say enough of you know, good things about David McGowan who unfortunately has has died, I think, uh, last fall. Uh, he's out of the L.A. area, lived in the area of Laurel Canyon. He's about 10 years younger, perhaps, than, uh, than the hippie generation. He grew up, uh, you know, maybe a decade later. But his research into the what really happened in Laurel Canyon is a game changer. Absolutely. Uh, as, as you say, uh, and I've heard you talk about this in, in one of your... Uh, in one of your podcasts, uh, this was a, a, a covert operation. The and and of course, then you can start to look at the the British invasion of the Beatles right. and the Rolling Stones, etc., as being an operation of Tavistock, and the Laurel Canyon thing being a CIA extension operation uh, and American military intelligence. And of course, the clincher here, as as you've noted is that uh, Jim Morrison and, and uh, Frank Zappa and John Phillips and these, these real icons of the 60s who were the movers and shakers, these, so many of them, were children of people who were very prominent in military intelligence. Right. So, and of, and of course, you mentioned Jim Morrison of The Doors, the name taken from Aldous Huxley's book, uh, or not uh, William James' book, uh, The Doors of Perception, having to do with drugs and uh, the, you know, drugs in, in spiritual uh, 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 explorations, etc. Uh, Jim Morrison was not a singer. He was not a musician. Right. He was somebody who was just used and put in that position. And, and the world that you start to see when you look at the world that David McGowan has reconstructed is, is just completely different from the one that we're presented with. And that what you find is that, you know, there are children of elite families uh, who are scripted to take certain roles. And this can be serial killers. 
you know, you could right. have Jeffrey Dahmer coming from a good family to be a serial killer, or you, or, or that same family could produce another son who's a rock star, and then they are absolutely. Uh, that are moving us towards, uh, well, uh, a world of, of uh, you know, complete control, lockdown, fascist lockdown, I suppose. And, uh, and of course, as you, as you point out, I mean, the war in Vietnam was a, was a hideous time. Uh, our friends and our, our relatives were going over to Vietnam to die 13,000 miles away in a senseless war fighting uh, peasants in uh, you know who who didn't know the difference between communism and capitalism um and uh meanwhile our cia did uh, you read fletcher prouty's book uh, on uh, uh, the secret team our, our cia did everything to take over the vietnam war and the drug trade in southeast asia after the french uh, left in 1954 and uh, it was a, totally a cia operation the Vietnam War, and it wasn't until 1964 that any other services sent in uh, um, soldiers. Uh, but it was completely Ed Lansdale and people like that, The Quiet American, The Ugly American, our books that are written about this. This is completely a CIA um, covert op, which, of course, uh, escalated into this gigantic war. Uh, took 11 years of our, of our country, officially, Again, it started in 52, 53 under the CIA um, and killed maybe 58,000 Americans and two to three million uh, uh, peasants in Vietnam, right. Laos, and Cambodia. Uh, meanwhile, the heroin is, is uh, CIA had taken over the heroin industry from France uh, with, uh, you know, in Laos, the poppy industry. And uh, one third at, at one point, I think in the late 60s, one third of our soldiers in Vietnam were addicted to heroin. Well, you can see why they're living in a, in a sure. hell hole. Um, and the CIA just happens to supply them with the drugs. And then the, uh, the drugs come back to this country uh, through often, uh, you know, airplanes. Sometimes even the stories go, uh, you could get 50 pounds of heroin inside the body bag of, of a dead soldier. Right. Wow. Um, you know, I mean, this is, this is satanic. This is evil. And then, of course, our friends. I have a good friend that I grew up with in Virginia, one of the folk music guys that I grew up with, Jimmy Eisenberg, who, you know, was seduced <laughs> by, uh, you know, uh, the way Mick Jagger uh, was on stage and the way Jimi Hendrix was on stage. And of course, Mick Jagger and Jimi Hendrix were doing heroin. Uh, so my friend uh, was being a rock singer and uh, thought he was really special and cool and he did heroin and he was dead by the time he was 20 wow. of an overdose of heroin. So uh, yeah, we all know people that, and of course he was a tremendously creative guy, very smart. I mean, I grew up with this guy. He was always at the top of the class in terms of reading. He had read all of Steinbeck by the time he was in the ninth grade. Right. Um, this guy was smarter than me in terms of a lot of things. And I, you know, my parents both PhDs, so I, I guess I should be pretty smart. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I. But, but anyway, I mean, he was in the purple reader and I right. was in the blue reader. Right. <laughs> and so I figured that, you know, well, this guy's ahead of me, you know, and uh, at color coded with the rainbow, of course. So that's what we grew up with in elementary yeah. school. Uh, but anyway, uh, Jimmy was a was a casualty. And, uh, you know, I, now that I see the world spiritually more than I did then, um, you know, breaks my heart to think he's, you know, he's. <laughs> He, he, you know, I mean, he he lived through hell, and and may he be, he may be there now. I don't know. Yeah. His father was a minister. Of course, I can't judge. Uh, but he uh, helped me write some songs in which uh, he clearly understood the spiritual dimension of of, well, of life. Yeah, I want to stop for a minute and go into that, because at the same time we're listening to this music, and we're going to uh, uh, we're following the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and and uh, going to Woodstock. The culture is filtering out all references that allow us to see clearly what's going on. In other words, the devil doesn't exist. It's just 
Uh, if you go to a psychologist and tell them you're irritated by a devil, well, they'll give you some drugs and, and, and you can relax. And demons, they don't exist. That's not part of the vernacular. That's not part of the culture. So to deal with what we were seeing happening, say, at Woodstock, where some of the uh, performers there, notably Santana, I think Joe Cocker also, say that they were physically, well, they were incorporating an entity. They were, they were physically taken over by a demonic, I, I suggest demonic, uh, entity that, that performed through this music. So I think while well, at the same time all this is happening and we're being led in this direction, our ability to language it has been taken away. And it looks like just hey, a lot of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. We finally got out of Vietnam. They finally passed the Civil Rights Act, which was the worst thing they could have ever done to help anyone. Um, and, and here we are without a way to deal with it intellectually. What That's do you a very good point. Very good point. You know, I, uh, yeah, I mean, I've retired now from 30 years of being a professor, and I'm, I'm really starting to come uh, being, I have the luxury now with a decent retirement to, to explore these things that, uh, you know, when you're in a career, usually you're, you're, you know, you're kind of, your back's to the wall. There's, there's all kinds of things to do. And I, I've often thought that uh, academics was a very shrewd and clever system to keep smart people, you know, chasing their tails. Uh -huh. um, uh, so that they really, you know, they're so busy they can't really see the big picture. Because we're all dealing with, you know, our own little sliver of knowledge. But uh, one of the things that I've explored recently is a... Uh, <clears throat> I bought a video, a couple of them, uh, called They Sold Their Soul for Rock and Roll by a California pastor by the name of Joe Schimmel. Well, Joe was in the rock and roll business, and, and so he knows. He was possessed. He was writing songs, uh, and he discusses this in the film. Uh, you know, he tells the words of his song. Well, you know, he didn't even know what some of the words meant. Right. Um, he had to look them up. And uh, then he realized what was happening. He became a Christian pastor, and he was able to get his... Part of the words, I think, was he was going to sacrifice his whole family, you know, for the, the thrill and the power that comes with rock and roll. Well, he, he got off that train and uh, became a pastor, and he said he got his family uh, in, into that uh, denomination. So he says that, you know, fortunately that didn't play out. But yes, it, it, there's a three-hour version of this movie and a and a ten-hour version, and he has so many video clips of these bands, various bands. Uh, you know, so many of the songs are addressed to Satan. Uh, so many of the interviews they talk about being possessed on stage, giving them their energy. It's like they're a conduit of. Right. I mean, you hear this from Mike <sighs> Mick Jagger. You hear this Keith Richards. You hear this from. Uh, so many of the of the famous bands that if you didn't believe in uh, uh, spirit possession or demon possession, it, it would certainly make you think. <laughs> maybe, right? Maybe there is something to it, you know, because this is uh, you know they sold their soul for rock and roll is actually the reality. He tells the story in there, which I think is is well documented of the king of the Delta Blues, a guy named Robert Johnson, a black guy who lived right. in Mississippi, who, and this is in the film, uh, who, who was a really a lousy guitar player, but he, he would hang out with the good ones, and he would uh, grab their guitar at the break, and he would, you know, try to play some songs, and I guess he was terrible, and the, the, the audience would always complain to the real musicians. And then this guy supposedly went out, uh, well, he did, I guess, go out to the crossroads in, in right. Mississippi. And Clarksdale, Mississippi, on the corner of, uh, right at the, it's just, you know, straight cross, uh, X there between Highway 49 and Hi Highway 61. And apparently he sold his soul to the devil. And then he came back and he became the greatest guitar blues player ever and the father of modern rock and roll music. So here's a guy, and the case is pretty well established by lots of people he knew. He was terrible before he sold his soul. He was great after he sold his soul. Fantastic 
Eric Clapton heroized him and, and thought he was the best ever. And you hear that in the movie, you know, saying this guy was the, the greatest of all time. You hear Keith Richards saying the same thing. Well, you know, this is uh, apparently the, the reality that, that uh, it's, it's available. You know, right. and of course, this is what Robert uh, John D did. I guess he must have mm -hmm. summoned angels, and this is what Aleister Crowley did. He must, have, and I guess the the scenario is you you sell your soul for worldly power and and wealth and uh, whatever you want, and and then you go to hell. I mean, what a bad deal! <laughs> That's a terrible deal, if you ask me. Me too. And yet, uh, people right on through the ages do it. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm afraid this is what's underneath and behind it is this spiritual war. Um, uh, you know, angels and demons and God and the devil. And uh, for Christians like myself, uh, you know, Jesus uh, turned down that deal. Right. He said, you know, uh, bow down to me and uh, I will give you all the kingdoms of the world. And uh, Jesus said, no. And, uh, but then lots of others have, have accepted that deal. Um, and so many rock stars uh, that it, it, it kind of breaks your heart. And then these become, again, the idols. Uh, like my friend Jimmy Eisenberg, he, he kind of worshipped uh, uh, Jimi Hendrix and, and Mick Jagger, and he went right down that road. And maybe uh, Mick Jagger's got the physical constitution where he can, he, or Keith Richards, they can do heroin for a lifetime and live. Uh, my friend Jimmy couldn't. Right. Uh, um well, the, yeah. peop the people that are, uh, that are in that, that group that have already sold themselves, and I, you know, I, I really uh, think it helps to language what we're going through. I mean, I'm a Christian, you're a Christian, but the language really helps you understand and ferret out what's going on because there, there's nobody disguising this. I mean, a, a Bob Dylan talked on 60 Minutes about going to the crossroads. You know, and making the deal, and and that's what's happened. And it's it's so sad because some of the music I think is just so so very beautiful and so inspiring that to to know that it's produced by the dark side is uh, it's a tough one. Uh, well, I, on this movie which I was just watching last night. Uh, Anton LaVey, who, who was, of course, the father of the Church of Satan, which was founded right. in, what, June 6, 1966. He was an organist uh, with the Carnival. Right. And he said, uh, Satan's got all the best tunes. <laughs> and, uh, of course, uh, you know, if you read the Bible uh, carefully, as, as, of course, many do, um, there's an implication that Satan has lots and lots, or had lots of, maybe he has, lots of, musical instruments in his body so he was the head according to that uh system belief system kind of the, the choir director uh and and you know he could make uh, beautiful music uh, in worship of god um and then he uh rebelled as <laughs> the father right. of rebellion and revolution uh, on this earth as well and uh so, uh, yeah, music seems to be a very, very powerful tool to affect moods. And Anton LaVey says, yeah, mu music has the power to make you want to go murder someone or go to a mall and start wow. shooting. Uh, and he says that's just great. And if, and if the music can then inspire the young to look into Satanism, he's all for it. <laughs> well, okay, the lines are drawn here, you know. It's, it's like, uh, okay, the, uh, the enemy... <laughs> from a Christian right. point of view, is, uh, is working hard and uh, seems to be uh, having a lot of success. Uh, whether or not we're actually in the end times, I don't know, but it, gosh, it sure looks that way. Yeah, <laughs> looks bad. <laughs> looks bad. It doesn't look good. No, it doesn't look good. I always think of, uh, I think I've said this before, and I don't want to be too redundant, but the electric guitar, to me, just, it just, reaches right inside my chest and does what it wants to with my heart. And I don't think it's a coincidence that it was invented 10 years before the Great Awakening in 65, you know, the Tavistock orchestrated uh, breaking off from the parents, breaking off from the traditional culture, and then having this very powerful instrument 
to just reach in there and do and it. And they really haven't stopped using it. I mean, it hasn't gone, gone out of style. It's still the major, uh, even in the new music, which is, which is really horrible, which is another yeah, thing we, we should talk about. Go ahead. Well, uh, you know, the, the, the acid rock by 1968 and 1969 was, you know, it was awful. I hated it. And I always kind of, I, I really start, turned off the, the radio right. at, at that point. And I kind of went into, kept in my folk music and I got into bluegrass and I got into piano and I, I've made 22 CDs myself. But of course, the uh, power structure doesn't, you know, it wants to promote, uh, yeah. you know, its own, of course. And I'm not, I'm not saying that otherwise I would be, Famous, but I, I, I realize that the system is extremely rigged when you have, uh, you know, the Laurel Canyon story, uh, the, the sons and daughters of the military intelligence who are, who are of course, skyrocketed to fame uh, because they get the media exposure. Sure. Uh, there is big money behind that. And these, I have to, you know, frankly admit that, you know, I love Joni Mitchell and, and I love the Birds, the, the first yeah. uh, folk rock group, but they were really out of the Laurel Canyon scene, you know, and a lot of these, uh, I, I bought that record uh, and that was my, the first record I, long playing uh, record, the album that I bought was The Birds and, uh, you know, had uh, a lot of good songs on it and, uh, you know, it hooked me, um, but, uh, and I played in a, in a kind of a folk rock group in high school, electric guitar. Uh, but then I stayed acoustic after that all my life. Uh, but went off to college in uh, 1967, 68, 69 area. And all my buddies, uh, my friends, uh, my guitar drinking buddies from the East and the West Coast, they're all playing black blues. And uh, so I learned how to play that a little bit, you know. and. Uh, but it was it was in the culture. It was it was at all levels of the culture, um, the the commercial, the the media, the uh, even the academic. Even at that point, um, was reinforcing this again. You start to look at the Tavistock and the long reach of Tavistock and the and the and the uh, think tanks, like you've said. Um, the music is is a part of this system certainly had over overtones of the occult and satanism we didn't know it uh all we knew was you know whether we liked it or not we gravitated right. towards it uh you know some people would just i remember I was reminiscing here paul i remember uh going to prescott college which was fairly progressive liberal arts school in the late 60s uh, my friend and i wanted to drive to flagstaff uh, go skiing at the san francisco peak my friend had a Doors album, I guess it would have been a, some kind of a cassette tape or before that, and he played it all the way, you know, and Baby Light My Fire, and I mean, it was just, you know, it was numbing music, actually. Well, it was probably an 8-track. It was an 8-track, yeah. yeah. Eight track. <laughs> <laughs> Only yeah, old, old guys remember 8-tracks. But anyway, he loved that thing, and I, I wasn't quite as, uh, I still more or less liked acoustic sound on the guitar, but uh, that's because I started with that. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, it was a sea change, and of course, philosophers like Plato and Aristotle, you know, make these comments, or did make these comments, that, you know, when the music changes, the culture has to change too. And what Whoa. we see then is the, the actual deliberate uh, you know, from our superiors uh, in these think tanks, um, imposing this upon us. And we, we, we really thought, we really believed that the music was ours and it was an organic right. uh, uh, reaction to very, very oppressive war in Vietnam and a, and a police state emerging. And of course, Alan Dulles lived till 69. And a lot of the stuff that we're dealing with now, in terms of you know, uh, you know, rendition and and you know all kinds of uh, spying on citizens in America as well as abroad, and and assassinations and coups and concentration camps and Guantanamo and Abu Ghraib type things, he was doing this back in the 50s and 60s, and he was doing it really for the 
the moneyed elite, his clients on Wall Street, the people that backed Smedley Butler. In 1934, this brigadier general, Marine, most decorated soldier in American history, they, they, they approached him in 1934 and asked him to lead a coup, right. uh, a fascist coup, uh, to depose FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was the president, and so they could, they could run the country. <laughs> well, this is, this is the backdrop here, and this is the Prescott Bushes and the sure. George H.W. Bushes. Um, this is the Illuminati families, let's face it. Uh, we're dealing with sa Satanist families. Um, and many of whom the kids probably uh, were sexually abused mm -hmm. under satanic ritual abuse, and uh, you know uh, this is this is the the dark side of culture that that now is starting to see the light a little bit. Um, we're dealing with satanic ritual abuse, uh, and uh, we're, that those kinds of mind control have now been applied to the public at large again thanks to the CIA's MK Ultra Bluebird Artichoke MK right. Delta MK Naomi MK all these uh, top top secret mind control um, experiments and programs monarch uh, which comes directly from the Nazis they called it marionette programming so you could turn a human being into a um, a mind control robot some of whom would be sex slaves, like uh, Marilyn Monroe was evidently one of the first. Um, these people have been so fractured and fragmented in terms of their identities that they, you know, you, you really have to ask whether they actually have souls or had souls because they have been so invaded as a child and so controlled subsequently. Uh, it's very tragic um, to think that uh, human beings would do this to other human beings, and yet. That seems to be, you know, kind of uh, the, what's underneath this. And uh, since the, you know, World War II, especially with the Nazis, uh, and then coming into America with the paperclip and MK Ultra, it it has gotten more and more prevalent. And then it's gotten a greater and greater representation in our media system. Um, you know, our CEOs are. Our, uh, of our Fortune 500 companies, they, they're required to go take classes, quote unquote, at Tavistock, right. so they can be good soldiers in this uh, new world order, fascist new world order that is being constructed. And then music, I think, is that you know this is to hook people in uh, to the satanic um, world, uh, or at least so much of the so much of the popular music. And yet, music still has the power to bring us. Uh, to bring us up, I think, towards, uh, you know, truth, love, and beauty, the, the three transcendentals that uh, the Catholics talk about, uh, to God, I, I think it still is a very powerful tool, can be for worship, for, you know, and, and to edify and encourage and to uh, um, uh, make us the best. I mean, they, they've shown that, you know, kids listening to Mozart and other kinds of Bach, this, this just makes them smarter. So music is this enormous double-edged sword, uh, which, uh, uh, you know, the whole culture now is, is, uh, is feeling the effects, uh, especially of this dark edge of, of music that we're talking about. But let's not forget that it also has this potential and this is what I try to do with my music. I don't know if I'm successful. I, I really look at myself and I wonder, okay, I love music. Uh, you know, is <laughs> what is this music of? You know, is this, right. is this music of God? Is this music of the devil? Uh, how do I sort that out? I, I like beautiful music. Uh, you know, I gravitate towards what I think is beautiful music, but then it's subjective. So maybe you can have some perspective on that too, Paul. Well, I don't know. I was hoping you did. <laughs> Uh, I think I think it's very difficult because I think they've really been using it uh, to to put us wherever they want to put us. Uh, I I explore all different kind of music, especially old older music and, and new music. I'm always interested in something different. So we started listening to the music that was alongside the teenage music when 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 I was growing up in the late fifties and sixties. Uh, there was a there was uh, the teenagers were created at that point, 
I believe, and we were given our own music, and it was uh, uh, Dion and the Belmonts and the Fleetwoods and some of those old things. Bef this is before they really wanted to take us into the dark side. They were playing with that. But while we were listening to that, I think it's really interesting. Our parents were listening to uh, specific types of music that dealt with uh, secret agents and spies. It was a lot of, a lot of secret agent music. Uh, jet set. They, they called themselves jet setters. So there was a type of jazz and music that were jet setters. And the other one was a preoccupation with space because they were getting to, they were starting to get us ready to the 60s and whatever, whatever deception happened in the 60s. So, it was interesting that on the one hand they were dealing with our parents' generation and, and taking them. They were putting us into the kind of the romantic, put your head on my shoulder kind of thing. We were getting, we were really softened up and then bingo, here we go into the Laurel Canyon sex, drugs, rock and roll, the deeply satanic stuff that, that took me through my, uh, you know, the, the rest of my music listening was into ah, Pink Floyd and, and really uh, heavy-duty rock and roll. But to try to pull yourself out and say, well, that stuff was designed to entice us into kind of a satanic mindset and try to pull out of that music that would be good and pure and wholesome. Because, I mean, if you look at the... It's really tough to call yourself a Christian because it's liable to send somebody off into one of these churches. And most of the churches are just as corrupt as rock and roll. So it has, to, it has to be a personal relationship. Go ahead. Why don't you chime in on I that? I think that's absolutely a good, good uh, observation. You know, we have these uh, rock and roll, Christian rock now in yeah. the churches. And I guess this started in Southern California and has now swept the nation. And uh, I, I was playing music he, uh, with a guy down uh, not too far from where I live uh, about my age, who's quite a good musician. He had played with various Christian rock groups. And uh, he is now playing with a praise band at a Living Waters church down in Alamosa. And I decided to go visit that church uh, and maybe, you know, see what it was about. And I walked into this gigantic building with all kinds of little, you know, rooms for kids and for this and for that. And it's kind of a mall approach to Christianity. And uh, going in, seeing the main room there, there was a big stage and microphones and, and uh, you know, music stands and amps all across the front stage. And I, I didn't even slow down. I just kept walking out the next door. Yeah. Uh, because I'd been to churches like that in California. I was in a bluegrass band, and, and our bass player was the music director. He had a music degree. He was a music director at one of those churches. And it was a rock and roll um, uh, church, you know. And there's rock songs Jeez. are integrated with the, the uh, sermon of the pastor. And uh, terrible. I mean, to me, this is, you know, you're not supposed to mix uh, God and the devil, according to the Bible. Right. You know, you, you can't drink of the same cup of Satan and God, you know. And, and that's exactly what is happening at so many of these big uh, churches with rock and roll bands. And uh, it breaks my heart, uh, too. And so, yes, it is does make it difficult to be a Christian. Um you know, uh, I, I have to tell you a little story since we're talking music. Uh, I've, you know, spent, oh gosh, the last 40 some years trying to master the five string banjo, which is a, you know, a, a bluegrass instrument, a very challenging one. And I've had some good teachers. And the last one I had in California is a guy who uh, won the national banjo picking contest, I think in 2005 at, uh, at Winfield, Kansas, banjo player of the year, and he wins, wins other festivals. And for a little while, he was, you know, trying to make a living at it, uh, uh, winning contests. You know, right. you win, a, win a banjo, which you can sell for three thousand dollars if you win first. But of course, this fierce competition. There was a while there when he was winning those, 
And uh, so, wonderful guy named Brian Anderson, who also had been a Christian pastor for many years, and uh, gave up the banjo. He started out, I think, in high school playing banjo with a with a gospel group, and got very good very quickly. And of course, his heart was in the right place in that sense because he was. Uh, playing gospel music which is really praising God and it's acoustic and I love it uh, of course throws you into kind of the Baptist low church realm uh -huh. but anyway he uh, he did that for 20 years and then he then his wife said okay and he put the banjo aside and then his wife said okay well let's why don't you take it up again he took it up again he started winning the, <laughs> the contests you know and, yeah. and he got national champion well when I talked to him and took lessons from him I guess about you know 2006 to 10 or something like that um he was doing church at his own home he had his own little flock non-denominational right i think that this is perhaps where the real christianity is going to survive exactly um, yeah i think it's almost going to be an underground uh, um slightly subversive movement we're going to start to see the government the government's saying that uh, you know you know, we have all these domestic terrorists now, and and you know we have to watch out for these Christians and and these uh, veterans and these patriots and these people who believe in the Constitution. Right. And those are the bad guys now, you know. And so the government is going to target these people with the Department of Homeland Security, and I'm sure it is doing that now, um, with all the gang stalking and 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 you know neighborhood watch and citizen spies and the really a. a replay of the East German Stasi uh, police state is yeah. happening here in America now. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the Department of Homeland Security was formed right after 911, and now it's got 225,000 employees and a budget of something like 40 or $50 billion a year. Well, what are they doing? Well, they're gathering information on uh, American citizens, and they're spying on us, and they are they are isolating those of us who they consider as quote unquote terrorists or potential terrorist threats. Well, that's anybody who disagrees with the state. Right. That's anybody who believes in the Constitution. That's anybody who believes in Jesus Christ. Right. <laughs> that's me. Right. That's anybody who's a dissident, <laughs> you know. Uh, well, we've got a problem, you know, because our Constitution, uh, you know, uh, gang stalking is a, is a felony. Right. Uh, all these things are crimes, and yet that's what the government is doing with the help of our local police and right. with the help of our neighborhood. So we've got a criminal government, which has extended right down into our communities. And um, this is going to get exposed, uh, and the sooner the better as far as I'm concerned, because we still have laws on the books that say what these people are doing are is illegal, unconstitutional, it's a felony. And yet we have vast networks of people. Now, I think a lot of the people that are doing this are duped into it because they think it's, you know, their vigilante neighborhood watch. Right. They're going to get the terrorists. You know, they're told that this guy is, you know, doing something subversive and they want to help, you know. In that regard, have you heard of the Milgram experiment, Paul? Yeah, Milgram experiment. Yeah, I'm, what they found in the Milgram experiment at Harvard years ago, Stanley Milgram, the psychologist, 70% of humans will obey an authority figure somebody standing you know next to them right. in a white coat or a, you know a police hat or whatever and and they will believe them and if if that authority figure tells them to go ahead and say shock right uh, you know very high electrical voltage to somebody else they will do it absolutely uh, 70 percent of us are gullible enough and of course this is the good german syndrome um you know, just following orders, sir. That's right. <laughs> it's very scary, you know, that 70% of us are so uh, easily influenced by authority that we're willing to harm our fellow citizens on the basis of perhaps lies that that right. authority has told us. Uh, and yet that's what's happening. And uh, so all of these things, this gigantic soup of... You know, 911 was a false flag, uh, synthetic terror, state sponsored, which again sets in motion this gigantic police state here, which targets quote unquote domestic terrorists, which is anybody who doesn't believe, you know, the state's version of what happened on 911 right. or whatever. Uh, we're going into lockdown here.
and I and I know that uh, you've done an excellent show recently on Jade Helm and Tavistock. I listened to that, Paul. That's very very good. Very important. thank you. Uh, and that is, uh, you know, can be done any any time. It could be. It's going going right now in seven or eight states. All we need is a. Uh, a catalyst event, you know, like a financial crisis or a nuclear explosion somewhere, or anything that the president deems as an emergency, can that that drill, which is ongoing with large number of military in eight states, can go live, and we could throw us into a civil war scenario or even a, um, a third world war. Right. Uh, but meanwhile, that's that's the that's the kind of the catastrophic sort of Damocles scenario but meanwhile the gang stalking is going on and and is taking people out all over this country and all over the world people are committing suicide because that's these programs are designed to you know they want you to commit suicide they want you to take yourself out right. so they they profile you and what they do is they harass you in in ways that uh, you know they atomize you they isolate you as david mcgowan said eloquently in some of his in his interviews, and I'm sure he was isolated. I'm sure he was. I'm sure he was. I'm sure he was taken out by this this uh, this kind of program because he's the kind of person they would really want to take out. I mean, look at the beans that he spilled. He, I mean, that's huge what he did. Right. Uh, and and it, to me, it's mind boggling that it takes a guy who's with a a bachelor's in psychology who is mostly a carpenter to put this together. Just happened to be a good writer. Yeah. And now it's disseminated. And the secret, one of those big, big, big secrets, which they've sat on for half a century almost, is now out of the bag. And, of course, these secrets are coming out of the bag. Mm -hmm. And, of course, that's the uh, the whole objective of, of Jade Helm is to take out dissidents. So, obviously, we are having, a, a, right. uh, having an impact. And the state... Uh, the people that own the state are very concerned about it. So you could look at Jade Helm as a psyop. You know, it's it's supposed to scare people like me and you into silence. Um, but it's not working because I've got a bumper sticker on the back of my truck that says uh, gang stalking is murder. And then I've got right. another one that says gang stalkers go to hell. Right. And then I've got another one that says shooters equals CIA MK Ultra. And then I've got another one that says CIA equals cults in America. Right. And then I've got another one that says Jesus Christ is Lord. And I've got another one that says a good website on this subject of gang stalking called fightgangstalking.com. And that's all I've got on there right now. But, uh, you know, as I drive down the road, people are going to read that. And um, so that's a little bit of freedom of speech there. Uh, so, yeah, of course, they want to take people like me out. Uh, David McGowan. I mean, I've been working on the 911 thing since uh, since it happened. Let me just give you my websites here. Yeah, do that. Your listeners, uh, 911nwo.com is the one I've been working on. That's of course 911newworldorder.com. Uh, since uh, 911, I've also got one that exposes the global warming fraud. That's naturalclimatechange.us. Naturalclimatechange.us. And I've got one on the water issues in the San Luis Valley uh, called waterwatchalliance.us. And then my music website, which I guess I should mention, sure. since we're talking about music, is uh, just my name, ericcarlstrom.com. And right now I have a lady who's helping me update these things so that I'll be able to you know, better monitor them and add to them. But I make about one or two CDs a year. I've got 22 out. And um, like the bluegrass joke, all my CDs are million sellers. I've got a million of them in my cellar. <laughs> <laughs> in other words, I got my laundry cabinets full of my CDs. And, uh, you know, I have, have yet to find a way to really sell them. But, I, but it is fun to make them. And, and I feel like uh, it's part of my mission on earth is to try to make beautiful music. Because I think it is very edifying for the spirit. And I never really followed into the, the, the heavy rock and roll. I mean, my, I saw my friend Jimmy put a heroin needle in his arm back in 1969 or so. Uh, he'd gone from a very healthy, robust, tall 
athletic guy to a, to a shadow, very pale, skinny guy with very uh, seedy looking friends and uh, tracks on his arm. Wow. Uh, I saw that, you know, and that had uh, a bit of an effect on me. You know, to get, uh, I have a question for you. And this is a little bit off topic. First of all, I want to plug your websites. They're a cornucopia of information on those subjects. He adds more to them every week. Well, maybe not every week, but at least every year. And they grow bigger and bigger and deeper and deeper. And if you want to know something about global warming or the New Age agenda, they're, they're in, indispensable resources. I want, want to ask you about a situation that occurred to myself and Mindy. Uh, I was we were working in, uh, I was living in Vermont, and I was working, uh, I was doing executive coaching. And one of the guys that I coached was, he wasn't the pastor of a church, he was a high-ranking member of a church. And it was a Pentecostal church, and he invited us to go down to see it. Now, the draw was, at that time I was interested in glossolalia, which is speaking in tongues. And he said, yeah, we do it at our church. So we drove down Sunday morning, and uh, we went into this Pentecostal church. Now, uh, we were the only white people in the church. And they saw us coming in, and they displayed the biggest outpouring of love that I've ever had displayed in my life. They took us in, sat us in the middle, up toward the front, made sure we were comfortable, <clears throat> and then things kicked off. Well, the music they were playing was, uh, well, it was enchanted. I mean, uh, immediately you got all wrapped up in it. And it wasn't like there was a choir. It was like there were people all around us singing. And a few of them were... You know how you know, you know we know that the the system picks a few people they can make money out of and mind control and they're the they're the singing stars. There were ten people in this room that could have they were they yeah I mean they were uh, um, Aretha Franklin kind of quality uh, singers. And then they got really into it, really into it. And then one woman started doing a little glossolalia. Now, glossolalia is speaking in tongues. This, and, it, and it didn't seem strange at this time. It seemed like it was just a natural outgrowth of this, this beautiful, bluesy, kind of really heartfelt spiritual music. And, uh, well, the thing was over, and we felt... Uh, Geez, how would you describe it? I mean, I, we felt renewed, uplifted, motivated. Uh, we had seen something we'd never seen before, but it seemed really positive. What What would be your take on that uh, in, in terms of someone who looks at music? Well, <laughs> again, music is subjective, so it's a very yeah. fuzzy line, you know, a slippery slope. Um, I, I really have enjoyed listening to uh, the broadcasts of PowerProphecy.com, uh, which is Tex Mars, which is this, uh, well, he was 22 years in the Air Force. Uh, uh, then he, now he's a Christian pastor, does this home ministry, but also a mixture of geopolitics and, uh, and uh, biblical prophecy. I'm very, very educational. He's written 70, 47 books of 48 books. So I really recommend that he's done a number of, uh, of videos and, and VHS or DVDs and, and uh, a couple of them really expose the Pentecostal movement to speaking in tongues, the, uh, yeah. the Benny Hinn, the big preachers who are, who are making lots and lots of money, as you say. And uh, can't, the, the names of the pastors escape me right now. I, I would recognize them, but he, there's a lot of, you know, these these are the big TV evangelists, right? And the speaking in tongues that they do, uh, well, it, it, again, seems like they're they're possessed of uh, not the good angels, you know, the bad angels, the shaking and the uh, um, laughing and the rolling around.
down on the floor, the writhing. Uh, you see these people in their, you know, their their suit jackets. Uh, yeah. You know, just just acting absolutely insane. And uh, I think that they're, you know, the the what they're telling themselves and each other is that you know they're in the spirit and they're speaking in tongues. And that, you know, amounts to gibberish, you know, right. making up a new language. And uh, it, it sure looks uh, for all the world as if they are more or less, <laughs> you know, again, possessed. I, I, I have to think, Paul, that, um, okay, the story out of the Bible is that when Satan rebelled, he, he you know, he took a third of the angels with him, which is a lot. I don't know, you hear different numbers, you know, some people actually try to calculate, you know, 200 million or whatever. Right. But uh, <clears throat> again, the scenario is that these spirit beings, these demons, fallen angels, whatever, uh, they don't die. They've been around. Uh, they have watched the generations. They, um, they're smarter than we are. They have ways to trick us, which, of course, is why in the Bible, you know, we're supposed to, you know, put on the armor, full armor of God, you know, uh, to protect ourselves. Well, of course, a lot of us are brought up in secular families. We don't, you know, we don't, we don't have that armor, you know, so we're just kind of blundering along. And if you go with the scenario of the fallen angels, which there does seem to be a lot of, of evidence for with the possessed musicians and the right, possessed right. preachers and everything else. Um, the possessed uh, spies, you know, look at Aleister Crowley, look at uh, John D. I mean, these people were very bright people. But And, and then, of course, the whole MK Ultra, uh, satanic ritual abuse, uh, multiple personality, dissociative identity, identity disorder. The scenario there, and I've got a web, or I've got an article, extended article on the history and applications of mind control. That's my uh, chapter six under the New World Religion question mark heading on my 911nwo.com website. Right. Um, you know the the MK Ultra, which again inherited from the Nazis, which which is inherited from the Illuminati families. Of evidently the. Uh, this is what the Illuminati, it goes back to the book of the Egyptian Book of the Dead, how you can traumatize a child under six uh, with sexual abuse, or among other things. Um, and they split off uh, personalities, alternate personalities, in order to preserve themselves. I mean, the, the trauma is so tremendous that in order to survive, this is a survival mechanism, they split off another personality and they completely dissociate and, uh, at first and, and they, they lock away that memory to preserve themselves. They don't remember it. Uh, then a new identity comes to the fore. And then, of course, going back to this Egyptian Book of the Dead, if there's a trainer handy, there's about a 20-second window of time where they can assign a new identity to that individual. It's a new subaltern personality. They can install animal spirits, sure. demon spirits, or they can name it, uh, you know, Fred or, you know, uh, Betty, and Betty can be a sex slave or whatever, you know. And then Fred can be a, a assassin, uh, you know, super super soldier, whatever. Yeah. Well, apparently demons can be installed. And then, um, uh, well, then you're dealing with somebody who's got demons running around in their subconscious. Uh, they don't know it because there's amnesia barriers between these different subaltern personalities. Well, um, Russ Dizdar, who is a Christian uh, who's been fighting apparently these satanic cults since the 80s, he, um, he believes there are something like 10 million satanic super soldiers in this country, in America, and more in the world, of course, who can be triggered, uh, they have handlers, uh, to, to perform certain uh, tasks that they were designed for right. uh, at, the, at, the, you know, at the drop of a hat. So, for instance, we can run out of scenario. Let's say Operation Blue Beam were to occur, and this is, you know, there's military, is one of the many military plans that has been developed, 
And that is to have a mock alien invasion using holograms in the sky and things right, like that. Right. Well, let's say that there is this tremendous chaos-inducing event like Operation Bluebeam. Then all of a sudden, these 10 million so or so satanic super soldiers could be triggered to, uh, right. to fulfill their tasks. Well, that would be quite a chaotic situation, wouldn't it? Right. In fact, they could, they could go on a killing spree. They could, uh, you know... And then it's order out of chaos and all that stuff of, you know, the Freemasons, etc. Then they get their new world order. Well, they want to take down society. And it seems they have thousands of ways that they've been working on this. It's just phenomenal. So, you know, the, the persistence of this agenda does seem to be accounted for by the fact that, you know, there is this satanic, malevolent, overarching spirit. Uh, coordinating right. things and uh, with a lot of <laughs> a lot of help from the spirit world in the form of the powers and the principality and then the 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 help from the human world as well so uh you know i'm, I'm not sure exactly what launched me off it well I, uh, <laughs> i'm glad you did because i think that a lot of that uh it's it's not difficult for us and we're 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 not extroverts. We don't have a, know a lot of people to run into people in our everyday lives who have had this MK Ultra background. Actually, relatives we even know. And this last um, the satanic rituals that occurred around the, uh, the the Temple of Baal that was erected in London, and uh, you know, the Queen's birthday and all that ritual seems to have triggered off a lot of them because there's a lot of the bizarre behavior in the news. And we know people that we know have uh, gone off their rockers. So there might, you know, this, we might have, we might have lived through the first triggering event here. Maybe not. Yeah, you know, and what you, what you, what you run into, Paul, is that this is a dangerous world. Uh, a lot of us, uh, you know, kind of grew up under with a lot of false, uh, uh, a false sense of reality, a false sense of uh, how the world is. I mean, I, my parents, although I was baptized as a Lutheran because my grandfather was a Lutheran minister, my parents were intellectuals, and and then you know we we I was brought up as a Unitarian, which yeah. is you know kind of like this uh new age uh let's have all the religions and mix them up and everything works and it's all good and and uh, we'll have a you know the, the joke is there's uh somebody dies and there's there's two signs you know uh, as they go into the next world and one sign says heaven an arrow pointing that way and the other sign says discussion about heaven <laughs> of an arrow pointing that way. the unitarians will go to the discussion about, about heaven, heaven yeah <laughs> but yeah, the intellectuals who want to go to church and sing songs, you know, but have no belief in, in really, they don't have to have any belief in God or, or the divinity of Jesus or anything. So, so in that sense, I think the world that I was brought up in doesn't describe the real world. Uh, the real world apparently uh, does, in fact, include these very dark influences that we're talking about. Right. And unless you have a sense um, and, uh, of what's happening and, and the antidote or how to protect yourself, um, it's very, very easy to get swept up and uh, um, become a victim, I think, like my, even my friend Jimmy Eisenberg. His father was a minister. Um, Love you too. Okay. Well, okay, back, uh, back in the uh, saddle here. Uh, I don't know if you can see me uh, pick up this book. This is a very thick book. It's called Thy Will Be Done, The yeah. Conquest of the Amazon, Nelson Rockefeller, and Evangelism in the Age of Oil. Jeez. Okay, Nelson Rockefeller probably just as much or more than anybody else has has uh, controlled the politics of South America. Yeah. Uh, oil politics, as you probably know. And he has very much used the evangelical church. And, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's like that movie uh, at play in the fields of the Lord. Have you, have you seen that movie? It's a great movie. It sounds uh, with, familiar. Uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, Peter Matheson wrote a book. Uh, and then the, the movie is, uh, 
got Tom Berenger and, and Daryl Hanna and uh, John Lithgow, and it tells the story of a very sincere evangelical Christians who go down to the Amazon to try to convert the natives. And uh, uh, they're, they're not aware of the larger picture, which is that they're the first uh, wave of invasion. And what the powers that be really want is to get those pesky natives out of there so they can have the gold, you know. Right. And uh, so that's kind of the scenario of <clears throat> what has happened to the natives in South America, first with the Catholic Church and now with the evangelical church. Um, likewise, in my researches on Alan Dulles, I, you know, Dulles and his brother, Alan Dulles, uh, head of the CIA, and his brother, John Foster Dulles, who was uh, Secretary of State under Eisenhower, they were Presbyterians. And in the 40s and 50s, the Presbyterian Church was used very much uh, in their projects. So what we've seen then is the infiltration and utilization uh, of the churches at different times, different uh, denominations uh, for, you know, the power structure. Uh, so going back to this question that you, you raised about, you know, this experience that you had, which sounds like a delightful experience. Um, yeah, there's a slippery, there's a slippery uh, slope there. I can, I can tell you uh, an experience that I had recently a little bit like that, uh, getting back to our musical theme, I was at a, uh, a great bluegrass festival in, in Denton, North Carolina, put on by Doyle Lawson, who's got probably one of the best bluegrass bands that really does a lot of gospel, Doyle Lawson and Quicksilver. Doyle is from that area in North Carolina, which is, you know, the ground zero of bluegrass as far right. as I'm concerned. And uh, he had a, a great festival. He's done it for 30 years now. And great bands. And after three days of just unparalleled bluegrass, well, which, which has a fair gospel content, um, Doyle himself and his band went to, to uh, kind of preside over a musical uh, a church service the next morning. They had imported an old wooden Baptist church or something. And, of course, the... Fans, uh, including myself, uh, filled the, the old wooden church there. And there's Doyle Lawson leading the, the, the songs. And all these music lovers in this wooden church, no instruments. Uh, it was truly a religious experience to, uh, to be part of that and to hear the harmonies. Now, now, what's funny is that these old boys and, you know, retirees from North Carolina, very unexpressive. You know, they, they, don't, <laughs> they don't like talk much right but then you when they open up their mouths to sing oh my gosh you know there it is and so uh you know kind of uh kind of confusing but at the same time very inspiring the music um and that's what I, one of the things that i connect with about the bluegrass music is the the christian message the gospel message uh, the the virtuoso uh, instrumentals the virtuoso vocals in, in these modern groups but then it can it can flip over to the to the commercial uh, gospel sound. Um, I don't want to mention names of some of the groups that I find very very saccharine, uh, but there are those that I think are milking it, you know, and uh, it becomes a parody of itself. Uh, it becomes uh, something that is um, slick and uh, commercial. And there's the fan out there, you know, and they're just kind of going with whatever they can find that they like. And they get drawn this way and that way. I, I think there's a lot of room for wolves in sheep's clothing uh, when it comes to uh, kind of uh, this kind of quote-unquote industry. Uh, you know, the music industry can easily be co-opted by, uh, by the money and the agents and, and whatnot. And then it can become very... Uh, well, like these big TV evangelists. I mean, there's, nice. there's, they're, they're phony. They're, they're fraudulent. They're, uh, they're milking the, the public, you know. So it's, <laughs> it, it becomes very, very uh, challenging and confusing. Uh, the Pentecostals, the, uh, the evangelicals especially seem to be, uh, you know, prone towards, uh, you know, the speaking in tongues, uh, uh, hoodwinking. Yeah, their own flock. I, you know, you you look at the video clips of some of these events, and 
my gosh, you know, these people are being uh, uh, fleeced by wolves in sheep clothing, you know. Right. Uh, yeah, demons in human clothing. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's a better way to put it. And they're in the Christian church uh, right and left. So uh, when you say you're a Christian nowadays, uh, what does that mean? I don't know. Right. But I, I think it does come back to a belief in, uh, you know, the person of Jesus, um, the, the, the message of Jesus, the belief that he uh, uh, was resurrected. Um, you know, I, I just got a book about the Shroud of Turin, which, of course, is his burial cloth, and so much work has been done on that. And uh, it's kept in a Catholic church there in Turin, Italy. And uh, I believe, you know, I believe that was his burial cloth. And I believe that when he came back to life, uh, there was a burst of radiant energy, which, which kind of burned his image onto the cloth which was, you know, a, a cloth that was the type of cloth that was used 2,000 some years ago um, when he, of course, died and was crucified and was resurrected. And, uh, well, here's a little funny story for you. My dad's a geologist and uh, believes in evolution, of course, and his uh -huh. father was a Lutheran minister. Uh, carbon dating of the shroud back in the late 80s and I had read a book about it I think it was in the 80s at some point and uh, I bet my dad a hundred dollars I, I said this is going to date around the time of Christ and he is an earth scientist and I was I'm an earth scientist and uh -huh. uh, he bet against it and uh, turned out the date they came back medieval about 1300 um, so I you know right paid up my hundred dollars I was rather disappointed well, you know, now they've done some more work on it, and they've shown that, oh, about that time there was a fire. Right. And the edges of the shroud were burned, and uh, they evidently patched it uh, with a reweaving process that had just that was used in France at that time, in the mi Middle Ages, uh, where they actually wove uh, new threads in with the old threads, which, of course, would explain the younger right. date. And uh, so I'm, I'm once again... Uh, <laughs> believe that for those of us who are doubting Thomas's uh -huh. that this shows that Jesus Christ was was who he says he was which is God <laughs> right. well okay if that's the God of the universe um, yeah we want to we want to keep that in mind I mean this is uh, uh, you know in other words we're not gods and of course that gets back to Genesis right. and and uh, and the the story of Genesis and the ser the serpent tempting Eve and Adam uh, you surely ye can be as gods, and surely ye will not die. You can live forever. Well, this is the lie that, you know, so many of these rock group uh, stars buy into and so many of the New Age people buy into. Uh, we're gods, you know. Right. And, uh, it's, it's, it's right there in the Bible. No, we're not gods, you know. Right. God's God, and Jesus is God, and the Holy Spirit, these are God. This is God, and uh, it's, it's a proper view of of how things are in the universe yeah um, they, they worship the creation instead of the creator exactly yeah and it's very seductive and uh -huh. i know lots of good people that uh you know are do-gooders and want to uh, improve themselves and they live all around me in crestone and they are new agers uh -huh. and uh, you know they are light bearers they're going to be light uh -oh. bearers <laughs> yeah <What's> that? <laughs> they're light bearers all right that's, yes, I'm afraid there's a different kind of light. It's the Illuminati kind of light, right. which is which is the satanic Luciferian. Lucifer means the light bearer. Absolutely. Um, and so this is a this is a tremendous confusion that we have. Um, and again, you have your heart goes out for the people who are victim of these kinds of confusion cults. Uh, you know, uh, very confusing because they. They've learned how to exploit people's loneliness and, and their uh, confusion and, and, you know, love bomb them and pull them in. And right. Pretty soon you're a member of, you know, the Church of Scientology, which is right. going to take you for every dime you ever that's had, right. you know, and there's, make you think you're God. That's right. There's a lot of it out there. As a matter of fact, there's more deception probably than truth in that church. And that's, and that's really too bad because that's the, 
that's the life wrap. That's the that's the saving that's the saving grace. The way we came through it is we uh, well, in addition to hearing you uh, on Red Ice Radio, <clears throat> at the end of one one uh, interview, I probably said this before, but uh, Hendrick said. Uh, and where are you? Uh, where do you come down on religion? And you said, well, I don't have a religion, but if I was going there, it would be Christianity. And then, of course, a year later, so we've talked, and I've known uh, you've become a Christian, I've become a Christian also. But well, I came through it through, uh, through the study of Satanism, actually looking into uh, uh, ritual child abuse with, with two uh, friends of ours who had, a, had children taken in the Hampstead cover-up. And then, uh, and then finding out that the Satanists, the Satanists aren't shy about saying who their enemy is and who they belittle. I can remember hearing uh, the beginning of a concert that was Emmy Lou Harris. Now I, I think she's somehow connected to uh, Laurel Canyon. She might even be one of the original people. But she was. She came on, and before she played her number, she. Uh, made a little uh, salute to Satan, and she referred to his penis as his Jesus Christ. So you know that that's the opposite. You know, if it's it's called a, a, a prophetic research where you study the opposite to find the truth. So that's that's how we got there. And Excellent. Um, you know, whatever it takes. Uh, I think that that's a very legitimate way to get there. I mean, the good news really doesn't make that much sense unless you understand the bad news. Right, exactly. And, <laughs> and you've discovered the bad news. And uh, and the bad news, uh, even your example, I mean, let's go back to music. Uh, Joan Baez and uh, Emmylou Harris both, I think, are uh, very much a product of this kind of MK MKUltra uh, scenario like the Laurel Canyon people. Um, uh, Emily Harris's father, I think, was military intelligence. Yep. Likewise, uh, Joan Baez. Her father was a CIA a, a psychologist or psychiatrist working at Columbia, something like that. One of these MK Ultra spy psychiatrists, in all likelihood. <laughs> right. In some of her songs. Uh, now, of course, we all love Joan Baez and Emily Harris. I mean, I, I couldn't. They're good. Two more beautiful, finer singers, uh, and and beautiful, you know. Uh, so it's all there, you know. You think, my gosh, this beautiful person, beautiful voice, uh, uh -huh. you know. That's that's perfection. And yet, when you look a little deeper, it would appear that these two might be actual products of this uh, um, MK Ultra kinds of mind right. control, which which again it breaks your heart. I mean, it's it's. Uh, but it's in it's in the words to some of Joan Baez's songs. Uh, right. She admits this in her songs. I don't have the words in my head or, or can't call them up, but somebody who wanted to go online could find out uh, just what I'm talking about. Um, so, yeah, things are very confusing, and, and it takes maybe a little while if you're lucky to come. In effect, they'll shut us down. I was shocked to hear what happened to McGowan. I didn't know he was dead. But I, I think he had a, a fairly fast-acting lung cancer, but he smoked a lot, so it's hard to know exactly. Yeah, you know whether he smoked himself to death or whether uh, it was uh, induced. Don't know. Wow. Well, they have. I can remember seeing that uh, Senate hearing where, uh, among others, Senator Goldwater was sitting there, and they were talking about this little. Uh, now this is in the seventies. This little gun that uh, could del deliver heart attacks, yes, or fast-acting cancer. So That's right. I remember that. Yeah, it's well within their technology. Back back in the sixties and seventies, yeah. Yeah. So so now you know it's not surprising to see Judge Scalia um, being immediately taken out. Um, he was involved in. I think he was he. He was killed either during or right after a, a one of those satanic rituals. He was involved in a. Uh, that's what I had. I had read anyway. Yeah, me too. I had also read the same, that uh, that he might have been part of a cult uh, that was meeting in Texas, uh, and the pedophilia 
would have been a part of it, and he might even have been killed by uh, one of his, uh, <laughs> I guess, uh, younger sex partners. Wow. <laughs> this, now, you know, can you remember back to the 60s when you were in college, this piece of news, what, I mean, it would be so far out of believability, yeah. but, but in today's world, it's just... Uh, yeah, okay, well, yeah, he was probably involved with a sex cult and killed by one of his uh, pedophilic uh, companions. Oh. Isn't that something? It's amazing. Well, that's, that's certainly, the, uh, certainly that going around on the uh, Internet. Tex Mars has that on his website. And, again, he's a guy that I've gotten a lot of information from, you know. Uh, yeah, nobody gets 100%, though, uh, so you always have to kind of keep in mind there might be all alternatives that are, you don't know, you know. That's, that, matter of fact, that's a good topic. We should talk about that. Uh, how, the, how this movement is coalescing, and, uh, you know, a lot of us have a little bit of it wrong. A lot of us have a little bit more of it's wrong. But rather than dismissing people because they're just not totally on target or having, you know, knowing exactly, it, knowing the story exactly the way you know the story. Uh, but I think it's important that we all, you know, listen to one another and, and take the good stuff with uh, this, you know, be discerning, but still be open. Maybe. Yeah, I agree. I, I think if you look... Uh, I did an interview with Deanna Spingola recently, and she said something at the beginning to the effect that, you know, well, when I started out, I thought this, and then my opinions have moved along based on uh, new information. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's just the way it is. And I, I agreed with her wholeheartedly. It's, a, you know, you, you start from wherever you are, and assuming that you're honest and you want to find the truth, uh, you're, you're going to have to go through a process of... Uh, as you say, kind of uh, elimination, critical thinking, um, uh, going down this alley, going down that alley. And I think uh, some of the alleys are going to fool you for a while. And hopefully if you're, if you're uh, uh, really on the trail of the truth, uh, you know, it will self-correct. But we have to understand and, and admit that, uh, you know, we're up against people like Michael Aquino and the information warfare document that he put out in 1980. Uh, there's a tremendous war, you know, uh, the wars are won and lost in, in, in the minds of men kind of thing. And uh, Tavistock and, uh, and the CIA and whatnot are, are in the war for the, the, the battle for our minds. And uh, disinformation... Um, uh, it's used all the time, and uh, so, yeah, we're going to be fooled. Uh, but, right. uh, you know, when you, when you learn something, like going back to where we were, that uh, Joan Baez, you know, this icon of beautiful folk music, uh, had a father who was a spy psychiatrist at Columbia, and that she herself might be a victim of this kind of uh, MK Ultra mind control. I mean, this, this throws a whole different light on the, on the world uh, as we know it. Exactly. I mean, they're all victims, <clears throat> which is which is really a very interesting. We, when we went through this Hampstead cover-up, uh, the guy, the I don't know whether you know the story, but there was two children, and they were uh, they were uh, systematically, ritually uh, abused, and they were practicing Satanism d during the school day. And the father was the head of the cult and would assist them in decapitating babies that they had procured for that purpose. But when you look at the whole scenario, that it's a multi-generational satanic cult. So, you know, the father, the head of the cult, he's victimized because he was born into it. I mean, look at jo Joan Baez. I mean, she, just because she, she was born to a father that was a CIA psychologist, She's uh, mind controlled by these monsters, and uh, set about doing its its handiwork. I mean, it's 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 really we're all victimized, you know, especially these uh, artists. Yes, and you know, uh, Hitler himself um, 
may have been a victim like this, and, and he thought that World War II was all about the Superman, Ubermensch. And, you know, I've kind of pondered, what is that? What is the Superman? It could be that what he's referring to is does have to do with something like this um, satanic ritual abuse programming where you, where you uh, install demons within the altar uh, structures of the personality. And then you harness those energies, um, whether consciously or unconsciously, to get done what you need to do. I mean, this could be what he meant. I don't know. I mean, Joan Baez yeah. would have to almost be a Superman in the sense of, uh, look how talented she is. Yeah. You know? um, she's a star. Um, maybe you can program stars. Maybe you can make stars in this manner. Um, give them some extra power and horsepower uh, from the satanic world uh, that uh, they may never uh, fully understand. Right. Uh, these, uh, the demons are um, souls of the Nephilim. Do you know that story? I, yes. You know, I, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not that familiar with the Bible, but uh, that these are disincarnate entities that are looking to possess people to, to act through them. And uh, so they're, they're all around on that, on that mission. And, uh, you know, somebody like Joan Baez, uh, who has gotten that deep into it, I'm sure uh, could, be, could easily be a vehicle for this kind of uh, possession. You've got to call it possession. Yeah, and, and what's so tricky and so uh, challenging here is that, uh, you know, Joan Baez would have been the heroine of uh, a whole generation, of my generation and yours, um, yeah. for her, uh, you know, she was, she combined this natural talent, beautiful voice, untrained, beautiful voice, with this humanitarian impulse, which she's always kind of, you know, for this cause and for that cause. So, you know, what could be sweeter, more pure, more, um, uh, you know, you, you would really look up to somebody like that. And I've, and I've known, uh, people that uh, looked up to her on many levels. You know, I, I always just thought she was a great voice. Other females I know looked up to her as a, as a role model. So um, if it's the case that, as it might be, that she herself um, is a victim of this kind of programming, uh, which means she's not really in control of what she's doing, that she might be kind of a marionette uh, used for by others would have a handler, etc. Uh, that really puts a whole different spin on the world that we live in, because now our heroes and our heroines um, are not as they're not what we think they are. Yeah, they're, but but it's really uh, because we're programmed into this into want to be uh, uh, influenced by cult of personality by. Uh, we want someone to look up to. We want someone to be the hero. We want uh, these people to be loving, and they are loving. I mean, they're uh, the way the uh, you know. There's a, they, you pick if you pick your favorite movie star. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, I like Steve Carell. Oh, is that his name Carell? Steve. Uh, well, anyway, you you know that in order to to get into the movies and and take a place in the limelight that you've really got to have an arrangement with the dark forces because the dark forces run these industries and they influence through them. So you don't want that, to, you don't want to think that. You want to, uh, you want to think that they're just people that you can, that you could talk to and they'd uh, be God-fearing the same as, same as everybody else. But, yeah, and I think what, you know, that, the beginning of the realization that you just, you know, expressed, um, uh, when we start to realize how, how very, very uh, involved the, the Hollywood uh, and the music industry are in this uh, satanic program, then it becomes, uh, and, and the media, you know, the news, et cetera, yeah. uh, the, this, this it becomes then a matter of self-preservation to really limit the intake that you have um, 
I don't I don't watch TV anymore. Uh, I don't watch too many movies. A, a good movie I'll watch over and over again, but um, I'm not a real mu movie freak. I think that uh, we have to find the real. Uh, Michael Crichton I made a good statement back before he was, I think, uh, killed in an untimely way with a quick acting cancer. Um, he said the biggest challenge facing modern humans is to separate reality from fantasy and propaganda because and again he had, he was talking about the new age religion he was talking about uh, the global warming fraud back in 2003 his book uh, state of fear excellent book showing that the global warming is a fraud but geoengineering is very real and and uh, behind the global warming fraud that's really kind of a cover for the uh, weather warfare, weather modification, geoengineering programs that we have seen. So a lot of the funding would have come from, you know, quote unquote, the global warming. So what we've seen then is this, you know, all this government money going into uh, weaponization of the atmosphere, weaponization of space, uh, weaponization of the weather, so that it can be used as a, as a means of punishing uh, countries that are not compliant or or taking them down uh, economically uh, you know you slam a hurricane into a coastline right at uh, full full force or you you impose a drought like i think was recently imposed in california at uh, the bread basket one of the bread baskets of america you can bring a nation to its knees with weather warfare and so uh, behind the global warming cover story we have to get used to the idea that uh, the CIA has been running this country through Tavistock, et cetera, for all our lives, uh, going back to World War II and probably a little before, if you look at the Dulles brothers. And uh, how do spies work? Well, they always have a cover. They always have a cover story. So if intelligence agencies are running the world, well, it's not surprising that you're going to have cover stories. You're going to have a, a series of... Uh, of stories out there like Osama bin Laden did 911 right. or uh, driving our cars cars is causing catastrophic global warming these are the cover stories so to be an intelligent and responsible citizen i would suggest uh requires unfortunately looking behind these media um propaganda uh covers uh, to the reality <laughs> i remember when i was in my class human ecology I taught that for something like 20 years at Cal State University, Stanislaus. And uh, I, I quoted uh, Joseph Goebbels, the Ministry of Propaganda in the Nazi regime, who said, uh, a great country needs great propaganda. And, uh, and I said, yeah, Germany was a great country, is a great country. It had great propaganda, but people knew it was propaganda because they called it propaganda. Likewise, in the Soviet Union, you know, they, they had a great propaganda system, but everybody knew it was propaganda. Pravda was the only newspaper, and everybody knew it was lies. But in America, we have an even better propaganda system because we call it the news, and right. people believe it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and there's, it, it's, it's almost the most addictive substance on the planet because how many, how many videos we've put out talking about the fact that the TV it was designed. It never has been anything but a mind control device. They give you sigils. They give you symbols. They talk to your subconscious. You know, you talk about a million uh, or 10 million uh, people that are programmed and could be triggered. You don't know what's in your brain if you watch TV. You don't know what they've put in there. You don't know what opinion uh, that's not yours that they've that they've given you it's it's really it's an amazing thing but you can't people can't stop it's like uh the most amazing amazing phenomenon i mean we'll talk to friends and relatives and they can't they just can't seem to stop it yeah well i, I i'm not hooked up so i don't have a tv yeah and uh and i'm not on netflix anymore although i do like some of the movies that i've purchased but uh, books, you know, reality is, is very time consuming for me with all the books that I have and then with the beautiful nature where I live. Uh, reality is preferable to me, but I understand, and especially the young people, um, 
you know, they get their iPods and their iPads and their iPhones and their, um, their world is really, uh, it's, it's a mixture of reality and, and the digital computer world. Uh, I talked to a young lady uh, at an ice cream store, I think, as I was traveling down to Mexico uh, last year. And I was telling her I was going down to Baja and whatnot. And, and she seemed to think that because she wouldn't be able to find it on her iPhone, that it was not possible to go down to Baja. So in other words, her world doesn't include looking at maps. Right. It includes looking at her little digital reality in front of her on her iPhone. And if she can't find it on her digital reality, it doesn't exist. And uh, so I, I feel really kind of sorry for that person yeah. and that generation. You know, I, I feel a little, I guess, more fortunate that I grew up in a world where, you know, we looked at maps and uh, realized that we could go to those places. Uh, she didn't seem to think it was possible. <laughs> Incredible. Incredible. Well, we've been talking about you and I as boomers coming through. Right. Look at the millennials. Those poor those poor people, They're, the music isn't even good. Uh, it's bad music. They're uh, really tied into um, uh, their, their, their communication devices. And it's really funny. Uh, what they did with our generation is they gave us moral relativity. In other words, our generation were, leaned more toward... Um, you know, do what you want. Uh, you can rationalize it. It's subjective. There's no moral right and wrong. What what they did to the millenniums is it's reality relativity. In other words, my reality may be different than your morality. You know, like if you think that you're a woman even though you're in a man's body, well, that's fine. You know, if you think you're Chinese even though you're in a in a Caucasian or some other, but it's they've taken away reality. So we have, so they have a uh, they have reality relativity. You know, it's absolutely. Yeah, I think that's well said. I, what you hear around where I live in Crestone, which is certainly one of the new age capitals in America, even though it's very small. You know, people will say, "Well, that's your truth." Yeah, you, yeah, and and. Uh, um, and of course, that is encouraged here, and that's very much tolerated because we have all these different religions here. So a Buddhist would look at the world one way, a Sufi would look at it another, a Catholic uh, one way, a Baptist, etc. And uh, so you have your reality, and I have my reality, and and it's not up for me, up to me to uh, try to correct you, uh, because uh, you know your reality is your reality. Well, you can see how that could get pretty crazy pretty quick, you know. Uh, and, and even in Buddhism, they talked about, you know, uh, relative truth and, and absolute truth. And, and then they talked about true relative truth and false relative truth. False relative truth would be, you know, there's a bunch of bunnies going across the sky right now. And, uh, you know, that becomes your reality. Bunnies, bunnies galloping across the sky. Well, uh, we have to agree on, I think, if we're going to be a nation that's coherent and competent and capable of, you know, supporting itself and, and providing for a new generation. Uh, we have to agree, say, to speak uh, language. We have to agree on, you know, um, two plus two equals four. Right. Of course, uh, Orwell's message was, you know, Big Brother, you know, if you're going to play ball with Big Brother, two plus two is whatever Big Brother wants you to think it is or right. whatever. You'll say it uh, to, to please him because you're afraid of the pain of of disagreeing. Well, I think we're very close to that. Yeah. Um, people, people saying, well, two, two, two and two is whatever you want it to be, uh, because please don't hurt me anymore. You know, that's right. Uh, that's torture. And of course, uh, what we're talking about is psychological warfare against, uh, you know, kind of cultural terrorism, uh, of the police state here. Right. And the media and the Hollywood, all part of that uh, picture, uh, people are afraid to, uh, um, it took a lot of courage for our founding fathers, you know, to stand up to, uh, you know, the British East India Company and George the Third of England, you know, and and uh, 
and they had to put their lives on the line saying, okay, we're, we're not going to buy into that. There's been a long train of abuses and we can see this is not coincidence and we can see you're trying to subjugate us. Uh, so therefore, you know, we'll go to war rather than be your slaves. And I think we're there again almost in the sense that it's so easy for people to, you know, uh, from fear of, of some kind of reprisal, not question, say, 911, not question the global warming fraud. It's, it's yeah, whatever, 2 plus 2 equals 5 if you want. Right. Because otherwise I'm, uh, you know, I'm in danger. My world is in danger. Well, again, those founding fathers at some point stepped up and said, well, um, something's on the line here. Well, we're not going to uh, just, you know, lick the hand that feeds us and, uh, and uh, you know, continue to be their slaves. Um, America, I hope, has enough people um, who can stand up with that kind of um, uh, integrity. And, and, you know, some of the comments from our founding fathers, uh, integrity does come from kind of a moral compass. And uh, that was there in the majority of the right. citizens at the time. Integrity comes from that, you know, belief in God and the Bible and uh, the New Testament. And uh, if we have been pulled far enough off our moorings in that regard with the New Age movement and all this other, you know, satanic music, etc., then it's going to be easy for the... Uh, for the powers that be, the the ruling elite, uh, whatever you want to call it, the globalists, the uh, whatever, the fascists, the feudalists, uh, to subjugate us again, and I, I don't think there's much question that that's what they want to do, you know. Right, and here we have millenniums, and you've worked with them, who I can't even imagine having a conversation because you both have uh, different realities. How how do you, how would you move forward? Uh, you know, how would you how would you do that? And then, of course, they're devoid of morality because you know, our generation worked on that one. So it's 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 a pickle we're in, I think. Yeah, I would to... say we're in a pickle. Um, you know, and then it comes back down. I think you know, for yourself, myself, and whatnot, it comes back down to our own um, kind of being faithful to our own uh, beliefs and then hoping that, uh, uh, you know, there might be some positive spinoff uh, with others. I mean, we, we, we do teach each other by our example. Um, and uh, if we uh, set ourselves up to, to kind of stand for certain principles, um, and, and here again, I'm, I'm, I'm the first to admit that my life has not been um, you know, saintly, uh, or, or, uh, uh, above. <laughs> yeah, me too. Uh, me too. In other words, I'm a sinner too, you know? Yeah. Um, but again, with Christianity, uh, the nice thing about it is that, you know, you, you, you acknowledge that. I mean, we all are. And, uh, you ask uh, forgiveness and, and, uh, you know, we are assured that that is there for us, that there is a, a merciful, Right. A supreme being, uh, a God of, of love and forgiveness. Now, that's pretty compelling. Uh, compelling. If we can share that message with others, uh, I think maybe some people are going to buy into it. And, and maybe, you know, you think of those 12 apostles back in those early days. Uh, they had a steep hill to climb, 12 apostles. And look what has been accomplished, you know, in Jesus' name. It's still, so, that's right, it's yeah. still around. It's, 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 you know, it's bigger than ever, you know, so it's probably the, the dominant religion in the world in terms of numbers. But then again, there's a lot of, a lot of variations and a lot of uh, corruption of, of those churches. But, uh, you know, 75 to 80 percent of Americans would still identify themselves as Christian. So depending um, on, uh, you know, how how valid that identification is, I think that there is, there is hope. I mean, um, well, of course, there's always hope. I mean, right. if, you, if you believe that Jesus is the God of the universe and God is the God of the universe, then, of course, there's hope. Um, and, you know, they say Satan has a plan, but God has a bigger plan. So, in a way, Satan's plan, they say, fits into God's plan. 
and at some point, um, you know, thy will be done. It's gonna, whatever is gonna happen, it's gonna happen. And, and of course, uh, the book of Revelations is full of uh, fairly dire predictions about what what's coming down. Um, and a lot of people would say we may be very close to those those end days right now. Um, and then then it becomes a matter of you know holding on to your your hope and your faith and your integrity. Right. You know, even unto death. I mean, we're 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 going to die, and uh, if we believe in an afterlife, um, which of course I do, um, then. Uh, you know, which side you're on makes a big difference, <laughs> like eternal. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> I, I also think that uh, I mean, you know, how bad does the tribulation have to be? I mean, how bad do we have to allow it to be? Is there, do we as people alive on the planet today, functioning, thinking, talking, uh, can we mitigate some of the uh, horrific things that are... Uh, predicted to come down. In other words, how many, if we expose and expose and expose what's going on and people wake up and wake up, uh, I think that's going to, uh, I, th I think, first of all, I think that's what uh, Christ would expect us to do. And second of all, I think it's going to be good for everybody. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm one in favor of Staying active in this thing, not just, you know, resting back. And <laughs> Yeah, that's a very important uh, issue. Uh, of course, there are many Christians uh, and whole denominations that are committed to, uh, you know, let's bring it on because we want, you know, we want the rapture. We want to go to heaven. We want to, we want to set the stage for, you know, the end days. And, and they're very quite excited about it. Um and then you get people like Tex Mars, like I say, who who would have, a, I think, a more realistic long-term picture, which is that, look, it, Satan has been trying to bring us to this point, uh, you know, basically, you know, since Jesus was crucified and before. Uh -huh. And uh, the only thing that has kept us uh, from falling into complete satanic antichrist kingdom is the work of Christians who opposed uh, Satan. And, and then, you know, he do quote the Bible saying, uh, uh, you know, Jesus came to expose and oppose the works of the devil. And those of us who would, would want to count ourselves as Christian then would have some uh, responsibility, I think, to do I that, think. which is, which is, you know, we're, we're looking for the truth. He is the truth. Um, we're looking, you know, to the, the uh, to to counter to do to be as representatives, hopefully, on on this planet. Um, I, I think that's probably for me the safest and most logical uh, approach uh, at this point. Uh, makes most sense to me, uh, but it's not comfortable because if you oppose the world system, and of course Satan is the ruler of this world, uh, you're going to catch some heat and you're going to get some right. opposition. <laughs> right. Right, but you just have to keep your uh, keep your faith, keep your mind together, and keep going. Uh, <clears throat> you know, doing whatever is demanded of you, and it's it's kind of not like demanded. It's like you get out of your brain and into your mind, and you let yourself do the right thing every day, and uh, it leads you to. Uh, doing things like we just did, having a great conversation on on music and how Satanism uh, influences that music and how the elites are using Satanism to control us, mind control us, and bring us into the destruction of uh, the Creator's precious creations. So Yeah, absolutely, Paul. Uh, let, let me just... Uh... Uh, that kind of uh, triggered a thought, which which I had before the conversation, and and it comes back, which is okay. Why would a guy like Alistair Crowley, MI6 British, uh, Cambridge grad, uh, went to uh, you know climb in the Himalayas? Obviously right. a very powerful guy. Why would he become a Satanist? Why would he try to bring so many others to Satan? Well, you can look at this from the spiritual point of view. 
uh, obviously he did become a Satanist. Obviously, if you believe in that, he's, he's resting in hell today. Um, but there's another reason, and that, I think, is the ruling elite wants society to fall into chaos, so they will have an excuse to come in and impose martial law. Right. You know, in other words, you people can't take care of yourselves. You can't, you cannot um, rule yourselves. You're incompetent to rule yourselves. You're out of control, so we're going to have to send in the troops. Now, if you have a society which is uh, self-moderating, uh, a, a Christian society, which I think America was <laughs> until, it was. until our generation, you know, I mean, yeah. we've been duped. I mean, we've been duped. We've been duped. We're always fooled into going to wars, you know, for some bogus reason. But there was this core, Christian core of, uh, uh, I think, I could be wrong on that, uh, a Christian core of, of kind of self-control. Uh, and I think what the 60s and the music is about is just throw that out the window. And, and, and of course, that will send, if you believe in the spiritual world, which, which we do, will send individuals to hell on a personal level. But it will also take the whole society with it. And then the feudalists, the, the, the uh, martial law people can more justifiably come in and say, well, we're going to have to take over. Uh, we, in yeah. fact, they, they've been trying to create the chaos so that they can impose the new order so yeah yeah i think it's i think it's something to look forward to i don't know <laughs> it could get hairy <laughs> it's really good well eric this has been a great conversation i want you to remind people of your websites because i've spent a lot of time on there and you can learn a lot on a, very, a couple subjects and then we'll We'll sign off. Tell them about your websites, Eric. Okay, Paul. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Very interesting discussion. Uh, something that we both have some track record with, which is the music and the culture. Right. But, yeah, my websites are, uh, uh, again, as a 30-year university professor, um, I have, you know, just from a logical point of view, come to realize that 911 was not as it was portrayed, uh, and likewise, man caused global warming, not as it's portrayed. So you're starting from a logical point of view, uh, what's really going on? Well, that, that inspired my investigations. So that the, the websites I have are 911nwo.com, uh, for obviously for 911 and, and the New World Order, and then the Climate change, global warming site is naturalclimatechange.us, uh, and that really is my field, academic field. Uh, uh, climate change is natural, and so is weather variation. Um, and then uh, waterwatchalliance.us on water issues, and then finally my musical website is ericcarlstrom.com, just my name. And Carol, Carl Strum, O-M, not U-M, like strum a guitar. That's right, I, Carl Strum, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Eric. This has been a fascinating conversation, and I hope, uh, hope we can do it again in the future. Thank you very much, Paul, for your efforts. I think uh, it's really, really enjoyable. Uh, now that you're in Ecuador to make this, uh, this cross-continental uh, <laughs> communication we have going. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Take Bye -bye. care. Have a good day. Same to you, Eric. Thank you.